church you doing good today so here's the thing I ask it every time I preach and then I make you repeat it every time because it's not good enough good morning church you doing good today that's all right that's fine we'll try again next time no that was really good that was really good I want to just welcome you again here my name is Lucas I'm one of the pastors on our, on our staff and it is my honor it's my privilege to preach this morning. Pastor Andy's out at West Shore preaching last week's message. So Andy went with a box of like tissue box, you know, tissue paper because we were all crying last week, right? And so he's out there. He's excited to be preaching at that campus. So again, my honor to be here. And we're continuing on in our series, Future Church. Um, before we get there, I do want to say it's so important to me that um, we pray against the fall coming, Chris. I don't want that. None of this. I don't know about you, but I'm just like a little more sun. No more, I don't want to see a pumpkin spice latte for like a month. If I see some of you in here are like, <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm just, in Jesus' name, no, right? Like, no, please no. We need some sun. We had no spring. Um, in, all, in all seriousness, we are, we, we kind of two weeks ago, and I want to encourage you, if you haven't seen these messages, to go online to watch both Vision Sunday, which was the 14th, and then last week, uh, Andy kicked off kind of this series, and they all come together. The heart right now is future church. The heart is, yes, name change, and there's some signs going up, and things are happening, but the real heart, the, the, the vision, the purpose, what we're actually talking about right now is not just about name change. It's not just about new things, this, that, ministry launch. It's about renewal. We're in a season of renewal, church. We're in a season that, that revival is beginning to take place. You can begin to see it. We're, that's the heart, that there would be renewal in your heart individually, that there would be renewal in your home, in your marriages, with your family, with your kids, in your relationships, that there would be renewal in the house, amen, that there would be renewal happening here. And I don't know about you, but I certainly can sense it, and I'm, and I'm sure many of you can like, you can just sense it. Like, I was, I was in the dentist chair this week. Dentist chair, just talking to my dentist about the, the, the revival that's taking place and healing and miracles and things taking place. We saw let someone to the Lord at our prayer meeting this Tuesday. And there's, like, th- there's things happening, friends. You can really sense it. You can really feel it. But I, I think what's so unique right now is not just that, you know, God is on the move. God moves. Amen? Like, God moves. But rarely are we so aware so aware that we are on the edge, the precipice of a, of a big, large next step for the local church. That we are not just saying, hey, right now we need this, but also what about the future church? What about the young? What about the next generation? And if you missed last week, a, a quick recap, Andy talked about how in renewal, as he, as he kind of walked us through Ezra and the rebuilding of the temple, you need surrender, you need prayer and worship, you need to serve. And then he landed on one point, one main idea, that we need to prioritize in empowering and training, loving and sending the young. And he stood here with tears in his eyes saying, what would it look like for us as a church to re- renew our heart for the next generation? What if we sent every youth and young adult on a mission trip paid for by the, the, the people in this house? What would it look like for us to empower them and send them and give them a shot in ministry and in their calling, whatever that may be? What would it look like if we did that? And so this week, like, I, I heard that last week. I sat on that pew. I heard it. And, and I, I couldn't help but be so inspired. But church, here's the thing. More than just being inspired by the content of our pastor, be, like rich content, being inspired to move, we have to act. Like, we can't just be listeners of the word, but we have to be doers of the word, it says in James 1. Like, we have to begin the process by which we actually put our faith into motion, or we take steps forward, where we begin to say, as a united church, what would it look like if we acted on the very thing that we are feeling and sensing in our heart? What would it look like if when the Holy Spirit speaks to me a word or a prophetic thought for someone, I went across the church and spoke it with conviction and with heart and with encouragement? What would it look like to truly act because, friends, we can, we can talk about the future church all we want, right? But ultimately, if we do not act, if we do not engage, there won't be a future church. Right. You know, he said, actually, he quoted this last week, Andy. He said, in the seventh month, this was Ezra 3.1, uh, the Israelites came, they settled in their towns, and the people assembled together as one. He kind of argued that the first thing they did was they set up the altar, and they prayed, and they worshiped. And I would almost say, no, first they gathered. First they came together. First there was unity between the people. And I think that's what I'm sensing here and now, that the future church, we, we need to be unified more than ever. 
Because I'm aware of two things. And the first is this, that, that the world is changing fast, right? I know I just sounded like a boomer or something, whatever. No, no jokes against the boomers. But you know what I mean? Like I just, you hear that all the time. The world is changing, right? Yeah, it is. It's changing so fast. Like I had a little sweet, little sweet daughter and she was innocent and wonderful. And now I have just a bundle of attitude and she's six, you know? Like pff, that. I don't know where that happened. Like things just move, right? They really do. They, they move so quickly. And second this, the, the world is changing fast. And two, the future church and the future of the church, and I mean that separately, and they go together, it requires unity. So how do I connect those? What is, how does that differ? What am I saying? Listen, t- in today's message, I'm going to be using older and younger generation a lot. You get to choose when, where you are in that category, okay? I'm not going to not gonna give you like an age. I'm not going to like, it's not, we're not, not by hairline today. It's nothing like that, Okay. Like, in many ways, there's, there's parts of me that feels like, oh, I have, I have some wisdom to give. I'm on the, on the older side. And in some ways, I know I'm for sure the younger. And in all these pieces, I'm not here to say you're on the back nine today, okay? That's not the message. It's not the title. Some of you are on the back nine, though. It's true. It's okay. Embrace it. It's a good nine, I bet. I'm sure. I remember for me, like, I, I grew up when, like, cell phones weren't in everyone's hands. I remember that. That's true. I, I do. I don't, I don't think it happened, but it happened. Like, I remember when Facebook launched, it was like, what is this book face thing? Like, you know, I remember, I remember those moments. I do. Technology, things move so quickly. The, and if you're old, if you're young, whatever it may be, it's interesting. If you're old, you, you, you don't maybe feel like you get it. And if you're young, you think that you're, like, running it. But the truth is, it's running you. Like, it's really difficult. And I think specifically, too, if I can just say this, the world is really keen right now on separating us by our demographic. Have you noticed that? Well, millennials fill in the blank. Well, Gen Zs, they only want to, you know, text like this or whatever. Well, boomers are always about here. Well, Generation X missed this thing. And they want to just kind of put us in a pocket and say that we do this or we've done that. And it's kind of like we're all at each other's throats. Well, boomers don't get along with millennials because fill in the blank and blah, blah, blah. While our world is like changing and dividing, I just want to believe that the church is going to change and yet unify. That we're, we're going to embrace change for sure. Yeah, the world is changing and, and the, church mod- like, the church moves forward in that change, but we don't divide in the change, we unify in the change. Like the future church is dependent on this. 11 a.m., are you hearing me today? The future church is dependent that we stay united together amidst our young and old all together. Now, when I say future church, what comes to mind? Like, to all of us, it may look different. To some, it would say a new building, and some would say a greater online presence. Some would say it's more church plants or changing our values. That's more progressive or more conservative. Friends, the future church is people. Friends, it's the people. It's, it is the next generation. It is the younger coming up. There is the future of the church in terms of an assembly, the ecclesia, the people of God, the movement. That doesn't happen without the next generation. That doesn't happen without the younger. That doesn't happen without the next group coming up behind them. And so while, while our church, again, excuse me, while the world wants to change and divide, I just want to believe that the church is going to change and unify And everyone has a role, every age, every demographic. We gotta stand, we gotta start, we have to be united, we have to make a decision to act. And so that's my heart today, to take off of what Andy said last week, to say, it's time to act, it's time to move forward, how do we do it? I wanna bring you into 1 Corinthians. Not necessarily because I feel like we as a church are, are here, but it really paints the picture of a church that isn't united, of a church that is honestly divided in lots of different ways. If you grew up in the church at all, if you're new to this whole thing, um, the church in Corinth is kind of a hot mess, honestly. There's a part where Paul literally says, it might actually be better if you stop meeting together. Like, this isn't going good at all. Communion is a gong show. It's, it's, it's totally, it's all over the place, and the rich are coming with the food and wine and getting drunk and full off it, and the poor don't know what to do. There's no prophetic word happening. The, the, there's no order whatsoever. The, the book really is about unity. It's about love, and it's about order. And in the first kind of six chapters, Paul kind of rebukes them. He says, hold on, you're missing it. You're, you're all over the place here. They're not listening to each other. They're sleeping around within the church with different people. Different, like, it's, it's very messed up. It's extremely, pro- like, a lot of pro- promiscuity. Friends, it's a, it's a harsh place. 
What's interesting about the church in Corinth that I find interesting and we can relate to is where it's located. You see, it's right on this like isthmus between two big plots of land. And so it's kind of right on, right on the ocean, right on the sea. And rather than going around the South Mediterranean and making a dangerous journey this way from Rome, or if you wanted to go to Rome, instead of going all the way around, you could kind of creep up across. And long before this place was anything, Julius Caesar kind of leveled Corinth. And then he sent all of his ex-generals and ex-soldiers there. He sent all these like, people with, who wanted power, but he didn't want them to take his power. So he sent them there and said, you can make money if you just help these ships kind of portage across this little plot of land. You can make a ton of money. You can do anything you want. Just enjoy this place. It's right in the ocean. You're going to love it. So they did. Rather than giving them leadership and sending the next person, he sent them away to just grovel over money, over sex, the the temple Aphrodite is there with over a thousand prostitutes, men and women at any time of the day. This is this place. You wonder why it was so, so hard, why it was, there was so much problem, there was so much difficulty and tension. It's because this place was literally built off the idea of, I don't want you to grow into your leadership. I want you just to fill your heart and your mind and your brain with money and sex and money and sex and work and money and sex. And so Paul comes in with this word. A divided church, no, no leadership, no nothing like that, just every man for themselves. He says this, it starts in verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has God has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Verse 21, For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness, there's that word again, of what was preached to save those who believe. Friends, if we want to be a church that is active, that is acting, not just inspired, but actually doing and believing for and building the future church, we have to be a church that leans on the wisdom of God, not the wisdom of the world. Now, please hear me today. I have four thoughts, four points, four things that I feel God spoke to me through the scripture. These are not like groundbreaking things. This is not like, wow, I would have never thought that. Like, this isn't, I'm not trying to shatter your mind with this mind-blowing idea. The idea today is not about inspiration. It's about activation. It's about asking yourself the real honest question, do I lean on the wisdom of God or do I lean on the wisdom of the world? Paul's making a point of connection here about the cross. To the world, the cross looks foolish. To the world, it looks like someone just died a very painful, horrible humiliation of, of death. But to, to believers, to people know what actually happened, that the cross did not hold him down, that death did not keep him in the grave, that he rose again, defeating the cross, there is power, there is wisdom. He's literally saying, in the cross, there is power and there is wisdom. To those who know it and understand it, it is the power of God. And he's saying, what's your source? Who, who's the wise man? Where's the teacher of the law? What's the philosophy of the age saying right now? Has God not made that wisdom foolish? Just by his, 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 his moment, just by his act on the cross? When you're in trouble, who do you call? Don't say Ghostbusters. Don't do it. I knew some of you were like, it's right there. Ghostbusters. Don't do it. That's my bad. I set you up for that. It's my fault. It's my fault. When you're not sure of something, though, like, who do you call? What, what do you do? When something's not going your way, you say, ah, oh, this is karma. Just bad luck. Is that where you go? Is that what you think? When you have to make a tough decision, and reason would say A, but faith and godly wisdom would say B, what do you choose? How do you choose? Whose wisdom do you let guide you? Because Paul's saying, listen, the cross looks like foolishness. And for all the skeptics in here, to you, who, who would say, yeah, I don't get it. Well, if he's God, why did he die? It doesn't make any sense. Because here's the thing, to us as Christians, the cross is this beautiful symbol of hope. We wear it on our necklace, you know, or as a necklace or something. Like, it's, it's this powerful symbol. In, in this day and age, in this time, in this moment, the cross was a symbol of death. 
They would have crosses like lined up from the gates all the way down for miles showing death and and tyranny and power. It was the Roman symbol of we will do whatever we need to do to humiliate and punish. But praise be to God. Praise be to God. He took this thing that was a symbol of evil and hate and pain and he put his son on the cross so that we wouldn't have to. And he made that symbol a symbol of hope, of life, of joy. That's why to the world it would say, this makes no sense. But to us, it makes all the difference. Are you seeing what I'm saying? You see what Paul is saying? He's saying to everyone else, this looks like death. But we recognize this is about resurrection life. This has the power to heal. This has the power to bring life and joy and peace to the one who is searching and seeking. That's the power, friends. Never forget that the cross was not the end for Jesus. The cross couldn't hold him down. The cross, again, was used as a symbol of power, and and Jesus switched it, and he made it this beautiful connection now for us. That's the difference between godly wisdom and worldly wisdom. Worldly wisdom is going to look like, it's oh, that makes sense, that's reasonable, but, but God works in ways we did not think possible, did not know. So can we just, can we hold back a little bit on all the podcasts and, and this book and that self-help thing? Can we just take a second and say, yeah, this stuff can be useful, but first I run to the cross but first I lead my family in wisdom that leans on the Holy Spirit. But the first thing I do is I ask Jesus, what is your wisdom? What are you saying? What are you speaking? Before I run to the Brené Brown novel, she's fantastic by the way, I first run to God Almighty, the Alpha, the Omega, the Holy One who has everything I need. I really feel like in this realm of wisdom, I want to sit here for a second. This is an area where both the generations and demographics of our church, as we think of the future church, we can share this wisdom. There is wisdom in this room of marriages that have gone 30, 40, 50 years. You need to share that beauty, that love, that wisdom with the young married couples in this church. There is wisdom in here of parents who have adult children who love them and love the Lord. Teach me everything you know, please. That is both meant to be somewhat funny because you've met my son and he's a crazy kid and also very honest. I have come to some of you. I said, tell me everything you've done. I like your kids. They, they still want to hang out with you. Tell me what you've done. There is such a wealth of, of knowledge for businessmen and women in here. Like, there is people, there's young entrepreneurs in our church that need your wisdom and guidance to help them see that, that there is gain in long term, not just short term. There's wisdom there you need to, you need to talk about. Can I say something? I, I really believe this when I, when I was prepping this message. That the immigrant and the new person to Canada, there is so much wisdom in culture and background and love and family and everything that you, we need to learn. I need to learn. I need to glean. There is so much that you have that you need to, as we as a church need to come together in generations and demographics to learn from one another, to see your life, your story, and more. There's wisdom here. But we have to act. We have to be united. We have to come together. We have to find that young man and say, listen, I know you're going, I know you're in youth ministry, whatever it is, and I'm praying for you. I'm with you. I'm beside you. Anything you need. When a young person comes and says, tell me how you did that, they're not trying to steal your secret. They're trying to learn. They're trying to learn. I just wonder if while the world is fighting for the upper hand, the church should be just giving it away. Right, like while the while the world is saying, I I got I got to get this next real estate moment. I have to I have to get this property next. What if rather than trying to beat each other and show like oh, like there's a real thing between millennials and Gen Zs, you know, it's true. We don't like I'm a millennial. I don't like when you put me in that group. I don't like it. Don't do it. I'm not one of them. I'm I'm me. But look what I'm doing. Right, like I'm already compiling to the issue, and so. What I'm saying is, is rather than trying to fight each other for the next step ahead, what if we came together united and shared and talked and grew and challenged each other? Verse 22, it says, Jews demanded, Jews demanded signs and Greeks looked for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. 
Verse 25, for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. He's, he's hyperbolizing here. Obviously, like he's saying, listen, even the, 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 the weakness of God, although there's none, even the weakness of God is stronger than your strongest. He's trying to paint a picture that there, these things are very different, that the world and, and him, that, that, that men and him, like they're different. And it's funny because Jews, Jews begged for a sign and yet watched they let the Savior walk right by them. Gentile or Greeks, they, they chased and theorized, and yet they watched like Christ incarnate, the Logos, the, the Word of God himself, walk right by them. You can, they're missing it. And we have to make a decision for the greater of the future church, for the next generation. We have to make a decision, every single one of us. Young, old, we have to stand faithful and grow, and we need to have a greater fear of the Lord than fear of man. We need to lean on godly wisdom, not worldly wisdom, and now we need to have a greater fear of the Lord, not fear of man. Again, not ground-shaking thought. This is something I'm sure you've thought of before. But are we acting on it? Are we truly, like, every single day saying, I will stand with the truth, the truth being Jesus? The people in Corinth were so enamored by, by the religious, obedient, intellectual Jew and the, and the deep-thinking, philo, like, philosophizing Greeks, right? And I want you to see this. It's important. Jews are so self-righteous in their practice, and Greeks are so self-indulging in thought. They ultimately had this image that they could not break away from, even when God himself came down and asked for humility and surrender and love and compassion. Why did Jesus die? Well, of course, he was sent to, but because the Jews cared more about their image and the Greeks cared more about their ideas and the fear of men and the cultural pressure was greater. Friends, if you are more committed to upholding an image than, than committed to the truth, then it might actually be the fear of man rather than the Lord that runs your heart. That is a hard thing to say and it's a hard thing to confront, but it is true that if you're more committed to upholding an image that you somehow feel like you need to be because this person might think less of you, or if I go to church, they might say this about me. If you're more committed to that than the truth, than the way, than the life, than Jesus, then the fear of man might truly be the thing that runs the will in your being. When men no longer fear God, they transgress, excuse me, transgress his laws without hesitation. The fear of consequences is no longer deterrent when the fear of God is gone. It's A.W. Tozer. Or kind of better said, if you will, we fear circumstances so much because we fear God so little. And that was Lecrae. We need a healthy fear of God that says, I care more about what he has to say than the world. I care more about his direction for my life than the world. I care more about what he's calling me to do than the world. And until we begin to act on this, the church is going to stay and look silent. But the future church is a loud church, a proud church, a church that says God above everything else, like Pastor Chris said, that is his call, his decision, his ways that I follow, that I listen to, that I am led by. Amen? I just feel like the fear of the Lord, if you're in the younger generation, again, you get to classify that, okay? If you feel like that's you, like, I really feel like for some, you just need a moment where the cross becomes so evident in your life. That could happen at First Wednesday. That could happen at church. Like, the only way I can describe it is the cross needs to just wreck you. <laughs> like, from the inside out, like, you just get a picture of understanding the sacrifice and love and atonement that Jesus has for you and for me. And the older generation here, like, if, if you would just lead in your practices, in your life, in everything you do with a fear of God, not a fear of men, the younger generation will see it. Because I promise you this, they are watching. And there is nothing that is more important to them than an authentic lifestyle being lived. Not about what you say, or do, or promote as an image. They see through it. They don't care. I say they because I feel that way. Like, as I lead, I feel that. I know that I need to live in a, an authentic life that chases after the gospel, not just push something on social media or this or that. It's why, you know what, can I be honest? It's why I'm so drawn and love our pastors so much. 
because I get to see the behind the scenes, the moments of prayer, the days of fasting that he tells no one about, she, uh, Pastor Lisa tells no one about. I get to see it. I'm so drawn to it because that's leadership and that's love and that's what, the way I want. That's, I see that fear of God, that realization that he is more important than anything else and I want it to. Verse 26, it says, Brothers and sisters, please underline this in your Bible if, if you can. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. I love that verse. Think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise. By the way, he's going to get a little bit harsh here. Paul's words, okay? I'm just the messenger. Leave me alone. No emails after this. This is his words. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Thanks a lot. Not many were influential. Ouch. Not many were of noble birth, but God cho chose the foolish things, you and me, of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. Man, I love this chunk of scripture. It says, brothers and sisters, think of what you, think of what you were when you were called. Do you remember when you felt that call? I'm talking about salvation moment. I'm talking about that moment where you felt like God was calling you to something different. Maybe to ministry or to a specific way to lead your family or your business or to teach or whatever it may be. I remember a moment at the New Spade camp for me. There was this little piece of carpet up in the left-hand corner. There's a big, just ketchup stain right there. Like it's just never coming out, you know? <laughs> like it's just never coming out. It's true. It's like the shape of Canada. I can actually think of it. It's right there. And I just, I call that my piece of carpet. And in that spot, in that moment, right there, God called me to something greater than I ever could have imagined, to something more different than I ever expected. Do you remember when you were called? Maybe it happened at church. Maybe it was in a small group. Maybe it was a moment where someone just prayed over you or, or a person came and gave you a prophetic word or the Spirit was led to you just in your bedroom alone, whatever it may be. I just think for us, if we're going to really action out and be the future church and, and, and consider what that would mean, we have to set in stone, not set aside the calling on our lives. Because here's what happens. We feel this. We, we sense this call. We know God is speaking to our life, and we feel in our heart. We need to set it in stone, but instead, we feel like we're not influential enough. We feel like we aren't wise enough by human standards. We begin to think of all the reasons why we don't have what it takes, when you begin to think, well, I could never do that. Do you not know my story, God? Are you, I'm divorced. How am I ever going to speak life into a marriage that I'm divorced? Wait, do you not know my story, Lord? Do you not know the things I've done? Do you not know how hard it is that I was on drugs before I got here? Do you not understand I was an alcoholic? How am I going to speak there? How am I going to speak in that small group? How is anyone going to respect me? Friends, the things that look foolish to the world, God will use for greater faith. And if you think for one minute, think about it again. The cross, the most humiliating, terrible way to die, God flipped upside down and literally said, I will use this, which was once used by the power of the Romans to now be the power and the wisdom of God. You think he can't use your story? He can absolutely use your story. There is not a single story in this entire church, now or forever, that cannot be used by our God. That is the truth. And we have to understand this. So, so don't set aside the calling on your life, but set it in stone and recognize that he can do so much more if you'll just be open-handed to him. But the future church needs people who love their story. Don't push it away. That understand that God brought you through a season to preach to someone else's. That God wants to speak into your situation so you can speak into someone else's situation. This is the whole point, that there are gifts in this room, there are stories in this room, that there is money and smarts and intellect, but there is stories and power of resurrection life, of redemption. That's what we need. If he can take a Roman symbol of death and bring life and peace and faith, what do you think he could do with a united church that says, I got it in my heart, I know exactly what he's called me to do? The power starts with the cross. It continues through his people. But here's the thing. Giftedness is not our problem. It's not spiritual giftedness that I believe is our problem. It's spiritual maturity. And this is why the younger need the older so much. 
can say what you will. I, I might be young and, 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 and I have fervor and excitement, but there's growth and maturity that has to take place every single day. And I have to lean on the wise and the old. I have to lean on that. So let us grow in spiritual maturity. Let us come together united. We all have a calling. Set that in stone. And yeah, you may feel like, well, I, I used to be a great leader and I don't know what to do. Maybe coach the next group of leaders. Well, I don't really know if I have what it takes to coach, but I have tons of resources. We'll invest into the next group of leaders. Well, I don't really get this whole tech thing, and that's fine. Let's believe that the next generation is going to use it for God's glory. Let them innovate and create. Let's help them see the bigger picture. Like, there is roles for everyone united together. But we have to work on our spiritual maturity, not just our giftedness. We have to set in stone. We have to remember when we were called. And bring that moment right now to the, to the forefront and live, out, live it out every single day. Finally, it says this, final thought, final just bit of verses as I close. I'll, I'll jump back to verse 28 to give it some context. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. Verse 29, so that no one can boast before him. I love this. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and our redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. It is because of him that I am with Christ Jesus. It's nothing that I've done, but more importantly, it's nothing the world has done. Now more than ever, and this is, again, you've, all of my points today, you've heard. <laughs> not anything new. It's not about, again, trying to uh, spark something new in your brain. It's about activating something in your heart. That's the goal of today, that the future church would be activated, that we would activate for the future church. Leaning on godly wisdom, setting in stone our calling. Fear of God, not fear of man. And finally, that we would stand united with the cross, not the culture. There's so much about the cross specifically. He doesn't often, it's not often Christ, he says. It'll be the cross is the power and wisdom. The cross, right, was used to nullify the things. Like the cross, he's, he's pointing out that specific moment, that, that moment in time where God sent his son to die for you and for me. And if we want to be the future church, if we want to act on this, friends, we have to stand united with the cross not the culture. The cross brings life. The, the cross brings freedom from those chains that would hold you back. It's not the culture. Friends, the culture, young person in here, please hear me. The culture does not care about you. I'm sorry, it doesn't. I'm not saying your friends don't. I'm not saying that we shouldn't ever engage in culture. It's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the culture as the trend, as the movement, doesn't care for your heart. It sees you as a product. It sees you as a product. It wants you to look, to see, to take, then buy, use, promote, and repeat. We have to stand united with the cross more than ever because there is no future church if we start to drift away from the most important thing that makes our faith it's the love of Jesus it's the love that sees you today wherever you are however, you're, however you've been whatever life has thrown at you no matter how lonely you feel the culture won't fix that you don't need more face times you need a love that's everlasting you need a God who will never leave you you need a hope that literally changes the circumstance in a moment because our God is quite literally that powerful that big that has such foresight into your life that can speak a word into you right now that can change everything it's the power of the cross. But there has to be a moment of humility to say, I've walked this path towards the culture for far too long, and now I come to you, Jesus, in the cross. It may look foolish to some, but it's wisdom to those who know. And 
older generation to younger, like we need those stories of the cross. We need your, your highs and your lows. We need to see the cross flow out of you so that we can see this new love take place for young people in him. Because I so believe that if you would get a picture, no matter how young or old you are, if you would get a picture, a full picture of the cross, you would be willing to do whatever it took for his church to die for it. That if you would just see what the cross means for you and for me, that you would quite literally be willing to die for it or live for it. Because he already did die, didn't he? Right? Like, we would do anything it takes if we would just see it in its fullness. I want us to get a greater picture of the cross today. I believe that's where it starts. But I want us to go all in. I want us to go in an active movement. I want us to believe for more. I want us to believe that the Holy Spirit, yes, is speaking to you and to me and that there is an act for us today. So whatever it is for you, whatever spot it is for you, let us be a united church that stands with the cross above anything else. Amen? Would you stand to your feet? Let me pray pray over you. your eyes closed, if you would, just posture yourself as you would to receive. And before we pray it, a prayer of activation, I just want to believe that there's someone in here today that needs the cross, that needs Jesus, that needs that renewal to start in their heart before anywhere else. If you come here today feeling in complete despair and discouraged, if you're feeling alone and you don't know what your next step is, I want you to know that there is a God who loves you, who sees you, who wants to walk with you every single day, that no matter the sin in your life, no matter the... the, the, no matter how, how you feel, like, I don't, I don't deserve this love. I don't know this love. He wants to speak it over you. He wants to speak it into your heart. He wants to be in relationship with you. You just have to say, yes, surrender to him. Humble yourself before him. Say, I'm pushing everything else aside, the culture aside, and I'm just running to you, Jesus. Choose him today. Let that be your decision right now. Say, Jesus, I choose you to be Lord, Lord over my whole life. Not one part, not this piece, but every part. Reign true in my heart. The cross reigns forever. And I just pray right now that every person who senses this and feels this would make that decision to run to you, Jesus. God, in this, in this house today, we just pray that we would be a church that is united. God, I earnestly pray for this right now, that we would be more united now than ever before. That the church right now, as we, as we look ahead to the future church, as the young coming up, God, as kids are in the classrooms right now being taught, that we would right now unify ourselves to every gen- generation, every demographic, that we would see the brother and sister beside us in the pews right now as true brothers and sisters. That we would be a united church, ready to act, ready to love, ready to reach out to any person who needs your love, Jesus. I pray, Lord, right now for the person who's come, who's ready, who feels like, just give me something, God. I pray you begin to open doors. You begin to activate their faith that small groups would start even today. I want to lead a group, Lord, would happen because they feel ready because you've called them to it. For more youth leaders to pop up and kids workers. God, for those who just want to serve in every which way. For for that person who feels like you're speaking to them in the prophetic, that they have a word for someone. Would they speak it loud and proud and boldly over people? God, I ask in Jesus' name that we would be a church that always, forever stands on the cross, that we would never waver, that we would always look to you, God, and what you did, that sacrifice, that it would give us so much hope for the future church. It's in Jesus' mighty name I pray. And everybody said, Come on, everybody said, Let's go ahead, let's sing to God.